talk about break tasks. And my name is David. You probably have noticed if you've worked with root bound Rails that there are these two different types of commands you, you, you generally tend to run. They fall into these two categories. There are the Rails commands and there are the break commands. For example, you might run Rails new to start a new server, uh, to start a new project. You might run Rails server to get your server running. You might run Rails console to start uh, an interactive session where you can interact with the database and with your Ruby code. And there's Rails generate, which makes new code. But on the other hand, there are all these break commands. There's break db migrate. Um, th this, is, this is a small, there are a bunch of break commands. And this is a very small uh, list of about five of them that I think are, are some of the most common. Probably break db migrate would be the most commonly used one because you use that after you've written the migration and you use it to apply you know, the migration to the database. Um, by the way, these are all just commands. You type it in the shell, you know, type it in press enter. Uh, so there's break db migrate, there's break spec, which you can use to run your spec. So you can just run break by default. But that's only if you're using our spec, by the way. There's rake routes, which will basically print the output of your routes file. So it'll show what kind of URLs your application can recognize. Rake middleware shows you your rack stack, which is basically a list of all the different internal parts of Rails that are involved in handling your uh, HTTP requests when they hit your app. So that's rake middleware. And then there's rake assets precompile, which will take your It'll generate like application.js, application.css. That's a, just a rake task for generating those things ahead of time. So anyway, what's the point of all this? These, these things on the right here, these rake tasks, they are what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So we're gonna talk about what is rake, what are rake tasks, how can you make your own rake tasks if you need to, how you run them, and how do you enhance or modify some of the existing rate tasks that come with your Ruby on Rails project. So first of all, rate is a gem. Just like Rails, it's a gem. I see Judd looking so I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Right now. Okay, awesome. Well, it's a gem. And you can prove it by going to rubygems.org and typing in rate in the search bar, and you will find this page. Let's see, can I get a laser pointer here? Um, <laughs> And you can, of course, install it by running gem install rate. Yes? Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Rails depends on rake. Every Rails project pretty much uses rake to do all these important tasks that we mentioned. But rake does not depend on Rails. You can install rake on its own in any type of Ruby project, or, or just in any type of project, because rake is a generally useful tool. It's a build tool, and what that means is that Rake allows you to record how to do standard tasks. It's, it's like if you have something that is this mundane task, you have to run a series of, of commands, and you need to do it regularly, how are you going to remember how to do that a year from now or a month from now? It's, it's, one way to do it is to write it down in a Rake task and document it. Uh, and that also helps you um, that also helps you coordinate with the other people on your project. You can make a rake task, and they can easily see the task that you've added and find it. But that isn't all that special. What really makes rake special is that it tracks the dependencies among the tasks. So I like to visualize it by drawing a picture like this. We have, in the bottom, we have these two tasks, task B and task C. And when we, what you can do is you can tell rake that task B depends on task A. So that's why we draw a line from task B to task A. So when, when you tell rake, I want to do task B, it, it executes some code to, it, it will execute some code to do task B, but before that, it knows that you have this dependency on task A, so it'll go ahead and run task A first. And it even gets better than that, because both, if you tell rake that you want to do both B and C, if you want to do both of these bottom ones, it will know to, to run A, but it will only run A once. 
because there's, that's just how it works. There's no need to run A twice unless you explicitly tell it that this is the kind of thing that needs to be run twice. So let's, um, but just to make things a little bit more concrete here, these tasks and the, the things you, what rake does is basically run Ruby code. You specify some Ruby code that corresponds to each of these tasks, and it'll run that code in the correct order based on the dependencies. And we'll see a bunch of examples of this later. But first I wanted to talk about where rake came from. Rake stands for Ruby Make, and the, because it's based on this really popular tool called GNU Make. And actually, probably most people don't call it GNU Make, they just call it Make. But it was made by the GNU people. It, it was made in 1977, and it's very popular for compiling all sorts of programs. In fact, Ruby itself is compiled with Make. The, the, the standard group, the Maps Ruby interpreter, is compiled with Make. But Make is really annoying and crappy, and, and um, hopefully you don't have to use it too much. Here's an example make file from, that, or a portion of a make file that I wrote for one of our products at Pololoop. And you can see that this make file is where you define your tasks and where you define your dependencies. And you have to use this weird make syntax. And this is kind of an example of the worst of it. But still, you have to use this weird syntax with a lot of dollar signs and parentheses. So the people who designed, the, the person who came up with break he came up with Rake because he was having trouble using Make. And he had to write a little Ruby script to get around some limitations with it. And then he realized, wouldn't it be nice if my whole Make file were just written in Ruby? If I could just define all my tasks, the names of my tasks, and all their dependencies, what if I could just define all that in Ruby? Well, that's what a Rake file is. The way you define your tasks and the actions associated with those tasks and, all, and their dependencies is you write a Rake file and that's just some Ruby code. Um, if you're in Rails, by the way, you don't directly write the rake file, but we'll get to that later. But here's a very simple example rake file that you could write. This is just, uh, this is just a rake file you could have in a, in a normal project outside Rails. And what it does here on this first line is it defines a task named default. And this arrow is part of the, the syntax that they invented for rake, and the arrow says that the default task depends on a task named test. And this is an array, so you could put any number of dependencies in there. A task can depend on any number of things. And then here, we define a second task, and this is the test task. And this doesn't have any dependencies, but we're passing in this block of code, so that is a block of code that will get executed if we need to run that task. Uh, one of the great things about Ruby is that when you, you have a block of code like this, it doesn't have to run immediately. It can actually run later. So your whole rake file runs, and all the code in that runs, except for these blocks. These blocks can run later once rake actually figures out what task you want to run. So you have to tell rake, so this is how you define the tasks and their dependencies. You write stuff like this. And then after you've done that, put that in your rake file, you have to tell rake what task to run. And the way to do that is to run a command at your shell like this. You, run, you can run the rake command just by itself with no arguments. What, and what that says is to run the default task. So we'll look for a task named default. We already defined default in this rake file, so it'll it'll decide to run default, but then it has a prerequisite named test. So it will run test first. And what test does, so when it runs test, it'll be executing this block we have here, and it'll run the command inside that. This Ruby command is part of rake, and it runs your current Ruby interpreter with the specified arguments. So it'll run this unit test file. So you, it's important to know that you you have this rake process, which is running in Ruby, and then it spawns this other Ruby process in order to run uh, your unit tests. So there's some separation there. Uh, that's, what this, that's what the Ruby command does. So you can either run rake or rake test in order to, to make this uh, rake file work. Yeah, so this is supposed to be a beginner talk. So if there, if there are any beginners lost right now, do you guys have like questions?
Okay, awesome. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Beginner, but maybe <laughs> why would you type duty instead of load? Oh, um, well, I think it's just nice to have things running in different processes. I think that if you type Ruby, you're probably going to get a much better error message from Rake if it fails. If, like, Rake will probably print out the error code for you. Um, if you just ran load, then the code in your unit tests would, might interact with your rake stuff. And I think it's just nice, to, probably just for a little bit of separation. But you could probably do it the other way too. This is the, um, too bad Jake isn't here, because this slide was added because he said on the LV Rug Google group, he said, I, I have no idea what file tasks are, you should tell me about that. And, uh, Jason was the one who suggested that, that I talk about it. So this, this slide is kind of for Jake and that Jason's suggestion. But anyway, a file task in Rake is a special type of task that specifically corresponds to a file. And these type of tasks were very fundamental to GNU Rake, but I feel like they're kind of less important in Rake. I feel like um, most people don't use them that much. But the point is that this is a special type of task that generates a file, usually from some other files that are and the, the reason that this is important is because Rake can look at the timestamps of the files involved and it will skip running the actions for your task. So it will skip generating the file. If it sees that the file already exists and that it's newer than the prerequisites. I'll say that again, it can skip it if it already exists and it's newer than the prerequisites. So this is very important because if you're compiling a huge program like Ruby or, your, or the Linux kernel, it can take many minutes or hours to compile it. So you want to be able to just recompile the part that changed. Um, so a tool like Rake or Make can track the dependencies and when you change one file, it only recompiles the things that actually depend on that file. So here's a concrete example. Suppose you have this, this thing that you do once in a while where you combine two files into another file. And if they're text files, you might just write cat, and you put both of the files on the, on the command line, and you uh, pipe the output of that into combo.txt. This is just, don't worry about that too much. It's just a simple shell command for combining two files into uh, a combined file, for generating that combined file. And you can imagine that this is more complicated. You could be parsing images and putting them together. You could be compiling programs. But you have this task that you want to do regularly. Now you can wrap it, um, you, you can run that command using the sh commands that Rake provides, so that'll invoke the shell that you're using and it'll run that command. And you can wrap this in a nice Rake task, and it's a file task. So previously when we defined task, we used the word task, but here we're using the file command, and that means this is a file task, so it has those special properties where Rake looks at the timestamps. So the name of the file we're generating is combo.txt, and that's also the name of the task. And we list the two prerequisites, which also happen to be file tasks, part1.txt and part2.txt. So this is how we tell Rake about our dependencies. And as a result, when we run Rake, it will smartly decide whether or not it needs to build combo.txt based on whether it exists and whether it's older than its dependencies. That's great. And if you're doing this kind of thing, you probably will end up wanting a clean and a clobber task. Rake provides easy ways to make both of those. Clobber is for removing the uh, all files that got generated, and clean is just for removing the intermediate files that you don't need. And if you wanted to uh, make a clobber or clean task, this is how you do it. But that's, I feel like most, um, this is kind of where the talk gets, this is kind of advanced stuff that probably most people don't need. So now we're going to, previously I was just talking about using Rake alone by itself, but now we're going to talk about using it in Ruby on Rails. So again, these are some of the common tasks you might need to run the Rake tasks. Does anyone else have a, a built-in Rake task that they run all the time uh, that comes with Ruby on Rails? <coughs> no? Okay, well. Uh, 
Oh, the free DB create. Oh, right, DB create, okay. The Mongoid stuff. Okay, Mongoid stuff. Okay, Mongoid stuff. Great DB test repair. <laughs> really? You run that? Oh, okay. Shunt runs great DB. Okay, cool. Great DB test repair. Yeah, I think that like sets up the database, the test database. Um, Very helpful, yeah. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> I thought that that was that command automatically runs when you call rake test. So I'm kind of surprised Judd runs it a lot. But well, I don't know. I have issues with that. I have to <laughs> run it manually too. I always run it. All right. So rake defines all these tasks for you. Like remember when we drew those uh, those arrows and we drew the tasks. Rake has already defined a bunch of tasks and drawn a bunch of arrows. Uh, with, so Rake has defined uh, all these things. I'm sorry, not Rake. Rails defines a bunch of tasks for you, and it, it defines the actions associated with those tasks, and it defines the dependencies. And most of the time, you can just take advantage of all the work that the Rails developers have done, and you can just run these Rake tasks. But there are some important things to know about that. So I thought I would just give a little tip here. You, by default, when you run a Rake task, it uses your development environment. So it will connect to the database that's specified in database.yaml under the development section. And it will also do other things. Um, basically, the Rails environment is this string that specifies a whole bunch of stuff about how your Rails application runs. And depending on what kind of, type, kind of break task you run, you might need to change that to a different environment. So the way to run that is to run a command like this. This first part here, Rails n equals production, is just a standard way in the shell of specifying a temporary environment variable. So you're temporarily setting this, this variable to, the name of the variable is Rails n, temporarily setting it to production. And then while that environment is set, you're running this rate to migrate commands. So you might need to do something like this if you want to migrate your production database. Uh, but generally, you might be able to just use Capistano to do And another important thing to know is how to make your own rake tasks. Because your project might require you to do some sort of routine task, like, I don't know, picking the winners at a contest, or closing a meeting in an LB Rug Topics app, or generating a new meeting. You might want to write some custom code that you run, and you might want to, you might want to make it be a rake task instead of just a standalone script. So, in, the, con in the, the context of Rails, you should not just be editing the rake file directly. Rake, uh, Rails provides a default rake file for you, and you shouldn't need to edit it. Instead, you can go to your lib slash tasks directory and make a file whose name ends in dot rake. And this is like a fragment of your rake file. This will get included in your rake file, and you can define tasks here. And again, the great thing is that the code in this block doesn't run immediately. It only runs when Rake is trying to execute that task. So here's, here's a simple task you could define inside a Rake file. It uses some things we've seen before, but basically this, this demonstrates that inside your task, you can run arbitrary Ruby. Put S is just a Ruby command. You can use it to output to the console if that's what you want to do. We, it also demonstrates you can use sh, again, to run a shell command inside your rake task. And that you could run a Ruby script using the Ruby command. And another thing that's new here that I haven't shown before is that you can write this description. This is part of the rake syntax. And it's available in general in rake. But you can write description and then give a nice string to describe your task. And by doing that, your task will show up in the list of tasks. You can get a list of tasks from Rake by typing Rake space dash capital T. Rake space dash capital T. You should try running it in your Rails app sometime. It gives you this huge list of all these different tasks that were mostly defined by the Rails developers in the source code of Rails. And it's just all this different useful stuff you might want to do. Like I, learned, I did that the other day, and I learned that there's this Rake stats command that'll print out number of lines of code you have in your controllers, models, lives. I see a bunch of people nodding. They must like that task. So there are there are fun things. Oh, I think there's rake fix me, which will show all the little to-do comments you have sprinkled out throughout your website. If we ran that on our website, the code right now would probably print out like 100 lines. 
So those are some rake, fun rake tasks, and you should try running rake dash teach sometime to see it. But anyway, after you have defined your own rake task by, by making a file like this and the slash tasks, you can run it just by running rake, just the usual way. You type rake and the name of the task, and it'll run it. But there is something to note here. By default, you don't have access to your Rails models when you're writing a test like this. You might want to open up your database, load some, load some uh, models, change some things. To do that, you need to add a dependency with the environment task. So that's why we add this little arrow here that points to the environment task. So the environment task is a special thing that will load your Rails environment and make all, make all those things available for you. So it's actually, what's going on is that there's actually one Ruby process. It's running Rake. And then when you run the environment task, it loads all your Rails stuff into that same Ruby process. So you can have access to Rake stuff, and you can have access to your Ruby on Rails models all in one place. So here's a very simple example. If you had a model named Post, you might write a very simple Rake task like this to access your database and print out the number of posts that are in your database. So we call post.counts, that returns a number. We pass that to put us, which will print it out on the console. Then you go to the console, type rake bar, and it will print out the number of posts. I think when you add this environment dependency, you'll probably notice that your task runs a few seconds slower. It takes a while to load that stuff. And here is something you might need to do. I think this is kind of more advanced, but I think it's possible that any of us could need to do it at any time. Sometimes the existing Rails tasks that, that were built by the Rails developers, sometimes they aren't quite good enough. Sometimes you want to extend them. You might want to do a little something to like clear some caches before you run your tests, or you might want to do something after your tests run, like print a congratulatory message. So, the, the basic strategy for that is that you want to study the existing rail, the existing rake tasks that were generated by Rails. So you, you would probably need to look in the Rails source code and look under, uh, look for directories named tasks in order to find what you're looking for, and that will show you what's available. And then once you know what's available, you, you so that'll show you like the names of the tasks and how the dependency structure works. So once you know the name of the task you want to enhance, you can enhance it in two different ways. One way shown at the top here is, is this is how you add a dependency to an existing rake task. You can access the task as an object in this first part here. A test pull and prepare is the name of this particular task. That's defined in, by Rails in Rails source code. And you can say enhance, and you can pass it some new dependencies. So you might want to pass it a dependency um, and again, a dependency is just the name of another task. In this case, the name of the task is clear caches. And that is something that you would have to define elsewhere. You have to define that task and say what it actually does in order to clear the caches. Uh, this is, we do something very much like this on our website, and it works. Another thing you might want to do is add additional actions onto a task. So if you're using how to add dependencies, you might want to add more actions. So you can do enhance, and it adds an action, so pass a block of code, and again, you can just put Ruby code in there that will be executed. Uh, these actions will get run after the previous, the pre-existing actions. So you could write it like this, and the spec task is the one that runs all your R spec specs. So you could enhance it and have it print out a nice message to congratulate you, or maybe it'll commit your files to Git or something like that. Uh, the important thing is that the Adding a prerequisite is a great way to have something happen before, and adding new actions is a great way to have something happen after. And, oh yeah, there's a link to a nice blog post about that. So we've, we've uh, had to do a lot of monkeying around with our rake files at, at our, uh, at, <coughs> to, to do these things. Again, clearing caches, or we also use it to auto-generate the images of the buttons on our website, because we have hundreds of, well, dozens of those. We also use it to add triggers to our database, because that's a feature of MySQL that we're using in the 
task to do that. We have four minutes, so I wonder, does anyone else, has anyone else made custom rate tasks that they'd like to share with the group? Yeah, Alex. I use it for data loading a lot. Because I, I do a lot of data loading on my phone. <coughs> oh, so, I, so I just uh, you know have a task I can just run and give it. You can give rate um, task um, arguments you didn't mention. Oh, okay. that part of it. And so I, I can just run the, the data loader with a URL to where I have my, my file setting and it'll yank it down and load it. Okay. Awesome. And uh, I had, uh, for an app that I wrote uh, back in my last job, I wrote a rake task that would um, more or less on a daily or every other day basis run through a series of reports, generate each one into a custom PDF document, and then take the batch of created PDFs, zip them, and then put them onto a server. So that was all down to a single rate task. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you know. Was it a single one, or did you break it out into a couple different tasks? That oh, no, well, it, was a, it was a single task that ran <coughs> several tasks that did that work. Oh, okay. Yeah, along the same lines, I go to rig tasks that handle mass mailings from uh, based on the information in our database. All right. Yeah, so it's a generally useful thing. And it's good to know how to do it. And if you still want more after this presentation, Brian Bates has a podcast on making custom rate tasks. It's from 2007, but 99% of the stuff he says is still applicable. Just to close your eyes when he's editing the database and use the active record, but the rate stuff has all stayed the same. Um, yeah, so are there any comments or questions? You have two and a half minutes. It dawned on me yeah. why Jed and I don't run, uh, why we run test repair, because we don't run rate spec. Okay. We run like uh, guard, oh. constantly running our tests. Okay. And guard just runs our spec, it doesn't rate spec. Yeah, that would do it. Yeah, it's not such a great idea to just run our spec directly because of that issue. But I guess you found a great workaround. So that's cool. All right. I, I would say so, yeah, um, you can't. Ruby developers are going to run into the rake and create custom, writing custom rate tasks like sooner than later, right? So it's really a good thing to to know and use. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yep. So if it was for anybody beginner, if it was. You know, understand, understanding why, and you, you know, it's really just it's helpful, and you'll run into it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Did you mention um, writing your rate task inside the namespace? No, I was going to mention that, but I took it out at last minute. But that's another thing. You can put the rate tasks in namespaces, and then they have like you have to run namespace colon. It just appends namespace colon. So that, that's how the tasks like db colon migrate are yeah. created. So db is actually the namespace, and migrate is the name of the task. Yeah, exactly. And you can just go read the source code of db migrate if you want to. It's all there in the source code rails. It's usually a good idea if you're writing custom rails rate tasks to namespace them, usually to like your your app or something, just so that it doesn't. Doesn't get away with anything. Yeah, great. All right, well, that's it for me.